Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today my special guest is Gary Burge and we're going to be discussing his new book, a Week in the Life of a Roman Centurion, which is published by my friends over at IVP Academic. Gary, thanks so much for joining us on today's show. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be with you. I appreciate a chance to talk about this fun little book. Now, it's always helpful for the listeners to get a bit of context for the authors we're talking to on the show. So take a few moments and introduce yourself to the listeners. Well, I'm a professor of New Testament at Wheaton College and uh, grad school. And uh, my specialization tends to be in the Gospels, and in particular, the Gospel of John. And uh, over the years of my career, I have been very interested in reestablishing the first century context of our scriptures. It seems to me that again and again, we read the New Testament, especially we read the Gospels, and we don't realize that there's a Roman context of the first century, which is everywhere behind our scriptures. And the degree to which we penetrate that context, that we get behind the scenes, we pull back the curtain on the stage, we look back there, suddenly the stories, the characters in our New Testament come to life. So uh, people who work, uh, as I do in my field, we are called contextual exegetes. We want to rebuild the context as much as we can, and we'll use everything at our disposal, ancient literature, um, sort of ancient architecture, the geography of the land, the cultural anthropology is even going to be at play here, the languages that were spoken in the ancient world. All of these things we want to bring to bear on our scriptures so that we can understand them more fully. And that's what I'm doing inside of this book about a Roman centurion. All right, well, thanks for helping us to get to know you a little bit more. Now, one of the places I always like to start is to hear a bit of the story behind the book. So Tell us how you got involved in this project. We know that when we write books um, about uh, the New Testament and its background, often they are almost always actually um, fairly didactic. They're very descriptive about what's happening inside of the culture. And uh, many times our students do well reading those things. I have a textbook with some colleagues that is out there now called the New Testament in Antiquity. It surveys the entire New Testament, giving a lot of this background material. And yet we know something else. <clears throat> we know that each of us loves a great story. And when we enter into a narrative of some kind, our imaginations are awakened. We stay with the story. We're interested in the story. And the story can become a vehicle to opening up this ancient context. So therefore, InterVarsity Press very creatively, it's a great imaginative press. Um, InterVarsity said, okay, well, what if we wrote some fictional narratives uh, to fill out the contextual background of some of the key characters in the New Testament. And the first attempt at this was Ben Witherington, who wrote one on A Week in the Life of Corinth. And he wrote a purely fiction narrative. And then what we did is we inserted sidebars in the chapters to explain why there are certain things happening, why a building is built the way it is, why a city is located where it is, why this character did this or that. And the book really did work for Ben. So I looked at that, and I had conversations with my editor at InterVarsity, and I said, you know, I think we could do this for Galilee. In Matthew and Luke, we have this marvelous story about a Roman centurion who is in Capernaum. He contributes to the construction of the synagogue of Capernaum, and he encounters Jesus in a very peculiar way. He's living there with his troops in Capernaum. His servant is sick, near to death. And then Jesus enters the scene. So I imagine myself thinking, okay, so can we rebuild this centurion's life? Can we just imagine what it would have been like to be a centurion? And that's where my imagination started going. So whenever you have a narrative like this, what you do is you imagine your opening scene. And I put him in a scene in a battle up on the Euphrates River in Syria. And some very interesting things happens to our centurion up there. And I begin introducing characters out of that scene. But as I told the story of this centurion's life, throughout every chapter, I am explaining something about how healing works, 
uh, why he has a concubine, what it means to have a family inside of a Roman legion, what is it like to live in a Roman legion, what is it like to go to a gladiator game. I describe all of these things. Our man happens to be a very earthy character. And I told university I wanted this to be a real centurion, not a stock Christian character in fiction. It has to be the real deal. So he has a concubine. He's very violent. He likes to go to brothels. He loves gladiator shows. He drinks barley beer regularly. <laughs> this is a really earthy guy. And then he meets Jesus. So it's an intriguing setup. And I want to reconstruct what it would be like for a guy like this to have an encounter with Jesus. And I think there's a lot that would be unpredictable in it. Well, in taking a step back from the story for a moment, I'd be curious to hear about your writing experience. I would imagine as an author who has primarily done nonfiction, taking on a fictional story would have been a bit of a unique and a different experience. Tell us how oh, that went. Terribly. It's a really unique experience because, yeah, I've only done nonfiction. I've done a number of books just describing the context of the New Testament. And so when I looked at this, I thought, oh, this can't be very hard. Let's just start. And it was paralyzing because you immediately realize how difficult it is to write fiction. I read a lot of fiction. I like to read really, really good fiction, usually that is award-winning fiction and would like to write like these guys do. So the first thing I had to do was create a story arc. And I think most of us who read fiction don't realize that the author has to know where he or she is going first. So I created a story arc for this, and I decided to create all of these characters that would fill out the arc. But oh my gosh, it was so difficult at first to begin to fictionalize a narrative. It was just paralyzing. But then what happened was I became curious to see how my characters were going to play out. And a friend said to me, you really know when a story is getting rolling when your characters begin surprising you. And actually, that's what happened to me. I was having fun with the characters, and that's when I started having fun. The characters began to do things which I didn't expect that they would do. The concubine of this centurion is a very interesting character. His servant, his slave that is with him, that is an important part of the story. So anyway, I found fiction to be very, very challenging. But in the end of the day, I found it to be also a lot of fun. And I'm hoping the readers will find this to be fun. Well, and besides the fiction story, one of the things that really sets IVP's Week in the Life series mm -hmm. apart are a number of elements that we don't normally encounter when we're reading a fictional story. Tell us right. about some of these unique features that I would say both enhance the learning and really the teaching possibilities for the book. Yeah, so the book is not just simply intended to be entertaining. So the book really becomes a platform where we can learn what the ancient context was like. So we have sidebars in every chapter, multiple sidebars. And what this is, is a block of text, which is separate from the narrative itself. And so in these sidebars, we are explaining why a character goes here, goes there, does this, does that. So there are sidebars about things like Caesarea Maritima, or what is the province of Judah like? I have a sidebar about blood sport and what it meant to be in a gladiator show. I talk about women gladiators, public sexuality, what that was like for Romans. I talk about circumcision. Anyway, each sidebar is an attempt to help the reader understand fully things that we wouldn't understand from the 21st century. So as you read the story, you're having a good time, you're also reading these sidebars, and you're actually learning about what the world of the first century is like, so that when you go back to the New Testament, you're going to be knowledgeable, you'll have a savvy for the world that Jesus lived in. That's the real aim. The aim of a book like this is really educational, but it's education mixed with a really good time. That's what we're hoping to do. Well, let's dig a bit more into some of the things readers are going to encounter in the book. Set the stage for what readers are going to find. What's the time period? What are some of the key cities or locations that the characters visit? And what's the overall social and political situation that's taking place at the time? Right. So what we know in the first century is that the Romans were really keen to control all of the eastern Mediterranean. They saw the Mediterranean as they called it their sea. And they had cleansed the entire Mediterranean of pirates by the first century. That was a very, very big deal. And then what they wanted to do was control it for shipping. 
In the Far East, in what we call today Syria, they actually called it Syria, they had a number of Roman legions in Syria. And in Syria, they were doing a couple of things. They wanted to pacify tribal warfare, but also they wanted to keep at bay the great Persian army, which was off to the east in what we call Iran today. Therefore, I decided that it would be awesome if I could have my centurion be a part of a Roman legion that was actually working the northern eastern frontier. And I put him at what we know as a Roman outpost called Dura Europas. And we have the ruins of Dura Europas are there today. And in the book, you can see pictures of it. So he's at Dura Europas. He is involved in some pretty heavy combat up in Dura Europas. And his slave is with him during this entire affair. His legion is based in southern Syria. And so actually I put him at a base in Rafana, it's called. We know that there was a real Roman legion. I actually named the Roman legion. It's the Legion of the Bull. So that's where his base is. And something really tragic happens to our Roman centurion. And he is transferred out of Rafana and he is moved to Caesarea um, Maritima. Caesarea is a Roman base, a naval base, actually, on the coast of the Mediterranean. And from there, he gets reassigned, and he is taken to Capernaum. And he's reassigned for a reason that I can't give away in the narrative, but he cannot go back to his Roman legion. Something happens to him. So what I have, actually, is a Roman legionnaire who is the head, actually, the head centurion of his legion. He has a concubine with him. He has a whole family of slaves with him. He has a head slave that runs his household. And these characters are all living out their life together in the context of the intense militarism of the Roman world and its empire. So when they get to Capernaum, this is a village that has its own Jewish leadership. It's a village where the Jews are actually divided about, do we hate the Romans? Should we fight against the Romans? Should we be compliant and work with the Romans. So all of those debates are going on inside of Capernaum. And our centurion, his name is Appius, by the way, Appius just steps right into that mess. And he's in charge of overseeing life in Capernaum. So really, I'm following sort of the details of his own career from battles in Syria down into the Roman province of Judea. And then finally, his last assignment in Capernaum. And we have everything from brothels to gladiator shows, uh, you name it, it's all there. You've already touched on Appius, but I think it might be helpful to meet a few of the other characters. So tell us about some of the other important characters the readers are going to encounter in the book, and how are they representative of some of the different people groups in the region? So what I try to do is, indeed, I try to create characters that would represent people who were very much sort of, you know, representing the kind of types of people that you would find in this place. So, for instance, Livia is a concubine who is living with Appius, our Roman centurion. And what most people don't realize, even though technically on the books, centurions could not be married, we know that they were. We know especially that the leading centurions kept households. Now, he does not have a wife, per se, but he has a household, a familia, it was called. And he's in love. He's in love with this young woman, Olivia, who at once is completely devoted to him. But because she is technically a slave, she feels this incredible insecurity about how she could be easily dismissed from the household. So she has a tenuous position. And yet what she uses is her sexuality in order to give herself security inside of this Roman household. So that makes it a really kind of interesting sort of sort of tension inside of the story. The servant along his way in Syria, Appius the centurion, picks up a servant that becomes very dear to him. His name is Tullus. And one thing that is important about Tullus is that he's literate. And because he is literate, and Appius, the centurion, is barely literate. Tullus becomes his scribe. And uh, therefore, for the household and for the centurion's business affairs, Tullus is someone who, as many slaves would be, he is academic. He is someone who will read for him, for read for the centurion, and interpret uh, the politics of the world to him. And this was common among slaves. We can't think about Roman slavery as we think about it in the North American scene of the 19th century. Roman slaves had a variety of roles, and many of them were incredibly important. In this case, 
the centurion actually develops an affection for Tullus. He really does admire this young man. And yet inside of the household, something unexpected develops. And you can feel that there is a kind of awkward sexual tension between this young servant named Tullus and the concubine Lydia. And that relationship has to be managed very, very carefully because it can very easily evolve into a triangle with the centurion. And this would have been common inside of Roman households. On the one hand, you have a centurion who is the great father of the household in his mind, and then you have relationships inside of the household that are at once dangerous and yet deeply affectionate. So those are a couple of the main characters. Uh, The fun characters I have is every household would have a lead slave who would oversee the estate, and I have an Arab slave named Gaius who is a really tough character, but he keeps an eye on everybody and makes sure everything is running as it should. The other thing I do is I have a number of important Jewish uh, characters. I have a midwife in Capernaum who plays a very important role in bridging the cultural divide between Jews and Gentiles. I have Jewish theologians in Capernaum who are wrestling with what it means to live under occupation, and they're managing the violent instincts of many Jews who wanted to simply fight against the Romans. So in each case, I've got a number of characters, and each character really represents a type of person whom you would find in the first century. All right, well, thanks for helping us to get to know some of the people we're going to meet when we read the book. And you've already touched on this, but I'll I'll ask it again. If you had to summarize it briefly, what's the overall goal that you have with the book? And how is it going to equip readers to better engage with the New Testament after they're finished? The overall goal of the book is to open the culture of first century Judea. That's the goal of the book. So that when we are reliving the life of the centurion, we suddenly develop an instinct for what it means to be in the first century. And our New Testament is a first century book. So, therefore, the more we are acquainted with the culture and world and history and life of the first century in this province, the more adept we are going to be at reading the New Testament with culturally informed eyes. That's what we want to become. And my hope is that when you read this story about a Roman centurion, this centurion, you are then going to have some tools to open other stories in the Gospels or other stories about Romans in the book of Acts. And suddenly you're going to have an instinct for what their life was like. So my aim is to enrich the New Testament and do it in an interesting way by rebuilding a scene, many scenes, that will inform our knowledge of that world behind the New Testament. Now, who should be reading the book? I can see it's going to be of great benefit to college and seminary students, but is this something that pastors or lay readers are going to want to engage with as well? Oh, yeah. I think that's a great question. I think this is going to be, I already know, it is going to be a supplemental text that will be used in New Testament introduction courses um, at the undergraduate level and even on the graduate level. I've actually tested this already with a number of my students who say, oh my gosh, I started reading this one night and I finished it in in a day or two. So that tells me that the book has the ability to hook a young reader and keep them interested and they won't even realize that they're learning things. I think for pastors, it it becomes a great tool as well. It becomes a fun way to reopen the first century world in a way that they have not done since seminary or graduate school. I think what happens is we are in ministry for 10, 20 years, and, you know, we are not reading or saying or thinking about fresh things anymore. And I think that this is a new kind of book that will give us that possibility. I also know that the book is great for lay people. I intentionally wrote it without a lot of theological jargon. And so if you have no theological background whatsoever, it will do just great for you. I know, for instance, I teach at Willow Creek Community Church in Barrington, South Barrington, Chicago here regularly. And uh, and their bookstore at Willow Creek has been selling this and it's doing really well. And I think those are just average folks who love the New Testament. They love their scriptures. They want to be stronger readers of the scriptures, and they want to get behind the scenes. And this book facilitates that for them. So I think it has a pretty wide audience. It's not designed for the scholar, really, who, you know, 
knows all of these background materials anyway. It is designed for someone who is breaking in, and they like a good yarn. Well, that's encouraging, because I think a book with your name on it coming from IVP, some people might be intimidated by that and think, well, that's just going to be for an academic audience. But it's encouraging to know that it's not. And also, you know, there seems to be a real movement amongst professors and specialists in the Old Testament and New Testament fields right now to take all of the things you've learned and your expertise and bring them down to a level where you can serve the wider church have resources oh, yeah. that are accessible yep. to lay readers. And, and this really seems to be just another great resource that's a part of that movement. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Many of us who are uh, academics, we tend to live in a world where we are exchanging ideas about how, I don't know, um, cultural things were working inside of the New Testament world. And that discourse, that conversation happens uh, from academic to academic scholar, scholar to scholar uh, correspondence. But what we don't do is glean some of the best ideas and actually bring them to the average reader. And so it's really a shame because the pastor who's producing a sermon, the person out in the pew, they never enjoy the benefits of scholarship. That's the unfortunate piece. And so a book like this is our attempt to bring those scholarly insights into a vocabulary and a language that just anyone can understand. So let's just take one example. When I describe a gladiator show in this, that it, it, blood sport was an enormous part of the Roman world. The Romans were acclimated to violence. The Romans liked the entertainment of violence. And having public deaths of either animals or people were something that they were quite used to. So, you know, we would look at that and we would find it shocking. In fact, I make my gladiator blood sport show in the book fairly shocking But I want it to be that way, because I think it has to give us an insight into how these people were living. So we know that as scholars, but rarely do we actually bring this to a level that everyone can understand. And that suddenly unmasks Roman culture in a way that most people have never seen. I think people who think they understand what it means to be a centurion will read this book and they'll think, oh my gosh, my assumptions were wrong. That's what I hope. I hope it really does change people's minds. I think when Jesus met a man like this, it was a really interesting and awkward conversation. This is a tough guy. He is. And when we portray him, the Roman centurion of Capernaum, when we portray him as a sensitive, spiritually interested, easygoing person who would have loved the arrival of Jesus, I think we're misreading the story. In order for him to rise in rank in a Roman legion, this man had to have a lot of very, very harsh characteristics. He was extremely tough. And that means the conversation between him and Jesus at the end of the book had to be written with care. And I think that readers will find it to be surprising and unpredictable. Thanks for giving us such a great overview of a week in the life of a Roman centurion. Obviously, in addition to this fiction project, you have a lot of nonfiction that you've worked on as well through the years. Do you have any recent or upcoming books that we should be on the lookout for? I do a number of things which are nonfiction. And in fact, University just released last year a very helpful little book that I edited with a friend, David Lauber. It's called Theology Questions Everyone Asks. And uh, here in about 200 pages, we outline all of the questions we hear in class over 20 years of teaching, the classic questions that every student seems to want to ask. And I predict that you'll find your questions inside of this book, Theology Questions Everyone Asks. And I think it's, it's a really, really helpful and important uh, book. The other thing that I published just recently is called Jesus and the Land. This is a book that is uh, published by Baker Academic. There were enormous debates in the first century about whether God's people should fight for the Holy Land. Should we go back and actually see that God wants to establish the resumption of Israel's empire in the first century? That was a big debate, and therefore Jesus has to engage that debate. So the book is called Jesus and the Land, The New Testament Challenge to Holy Land Theology. What's unexpected is that Jesus actually talks about politics and the Holy Land, and he has a perspective on that, and I actually examine that theme. 
The other book that actually is, circulates pretty widely is The New Testament in Antiquity that I talked about a little while ago. And this is a textbook for the entire New Testament filled with photographs, filled with sidebars, and it talks about the New Testament in its ancient context. And uh, it's used widely by students today in colleges and seminaries. Well, and for the listeners who are interested in any of those books, I'll be sure to include links in the show notes, which you'll be able to find at seantabbitt.com. You know, I have to say thanks for giving a shout out to a Baker academic title. They're my employer. So, hey, anytime uh-huh. people yeah. buy Baker books, that helps support Great me and my it. family. So, hey, go yeah. out and buy Baker books. That's what I always say. Yeah. And then I just want to comment on the New Testament in antiquity. That is just a beautiful, beautiful volume. The pictures are spectacular. Yeah. I wish we'd had resources of that caliber back when I was in Bible college. We had good books, oh, yeah. but they didn't have nearly as many beautiful color photographs. No, this book is absolutely spectacularly beautiful, and I can't take credit for it. I mean, there were three authors, three of us as friends worked on it, and there was a team of about a dozen people who worked as well on this. And we had people who were archiving and researching photographs from the ancient world. We just have a design team. A book like this, of its complexity and beauty, requires a whole design team. And so this is what we do today. And I think this book is a good example of how textbooks ought to be built. Now, Gary, if listeners want to learn more about you and your writing, where's the best place for them to try to connect with you on the web? I do have a website that I keep up for my students and for my uh, speaking engagements. It is simply uh, garyburge.org. And that gives actually, it will show you all the books that I've done as well as ways to get in touch with me. But of course, uh, at Wheaton College, we all have a web page and it's easy to t- find me, Gary Burge, uh, and then type in Wheaton College and uh, the links are all right there. So that would be the easiest two ways. The web is our tool of access today. It certainly is. Well, it's time to bring another episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. A many thanks to all of our listeners for being a part of our conversation today about a week in the life of a Roman centurion. For more on Gary and his books, you can visit his website, which you'll find at garyburge.org. And for more on A Week in the Life of a Roman Centurion, you can also visit the publisher's website, which you'll be able to find at ivpress.com. Gary, thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Great, Sean. Thanks for having me on. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbit. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Music